Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, got lots of pastors here from all over our country, and then we've got a whole bunch in Kenya. Go for it. Thank you for coming on. Praise God. Well, if you just gave us an introduction, I have no idea what you said. <laughs> but uh, it's a joy to be with you here, uh, with you there. Um, I uh, was unable to uh, come out, as uh, Richard said. Um, and uh, actually, yesterday, they uh, released all the restrictions on travel in and out of Thailand. So um, I suppose I could have made a last minute dash. But. Um, it wasn't possible, but it's great to be with you by technology. So uh, I'm, uh, can you all hear me? Can just give me a wave, somebody, if you can hear? Yeah? Okay, great. That's wonderful. Uh, just uh, very interesting to hear what Richard was talking about earlier, and uh, I'm just going to take a, a little bit to affirm some of the things that he was telling you by uh, giving you a bit of a history of what's happened here in Phuket, Thailand. Um, we have a festival here called the Vegetarian Festival. I don't know if any of you have ever been on your holidays to Phuket, but uh, every October uh, there's a festival where uh, thousands and thousands of young people seek to be possessed by demons and they skewer themselves, some through their head, through their bodies. Uh, there's no blood. Uh, when these things go, when, when they stick spikes through themselves. I saw someone once that had a, a, a tire going through uh, their, a bicycle tire going through their mouth and out through the back of their head and just parading through the streets under demonic influence. And so the threat of demonic influence over a city, over a nation is real. And we need to be aware of those things. Uh, and uh, one day I was driving home from church and on one of the hills in Phuket, there's a huge Buddha. And I just felt that it was looking at me or the spirit behind this thing was looking down at me and it was cursing me. And uh, I didn't think too much of it. I just started praising God in the car and uh, the feeling went away. But from that moment, I started to get sick. Uh, I went to see the doctor, and the doctor said, there's nothing wrong with you. But I was getting weaker and weaker. In the space of a month, I lost 40 kilos in weight. And I was just wasting away. And no one could tell me what was wrong. Uh, I, I prayed to the Lord, and, and God said to me, you're being attacked by the principality, the same principality that attacked Paul in Ephesus, uh, the Greek represented by the Greek goddess Artemis. And uh, one of these spirits of the air that people worship. And uh, so we started to pray. My wife had a dream that I'd been poisoned by a scorpion. Uh, and of course I hadn't, but when we investigated more about Artemis, we found out that she didn't attack her enemies openly, but she sent scorpions to sting them. When we recognized this, I'd become so weak that I couldn't even feed myself. My wife would feed me. I shared with the pastors, the other pastors in the churches in, in Phuket, what had happened, and they didn't believe me but they could see that I was getting weaker and weaker. So they agreed to carry me. I, I couldn't walk. They carried me up the mountain to where this uh, statue was. And it's about 40 feet tall. It's a huge statue. And uh, I said to them, carry me round the statue. We're going to pray around this statue. We're going to bind it in the name of Jesus. And we're going to loose the blessing of God over Phuket. I want to tell you that when you bless, it is a very powerful weapon that God has given us. Because when we bless, we push back the darkness. This is what Jesus told us to do in Luke chapter 10. Uh, he said, when you first enter a city, speak peace to that city. And so we started to speak peace and we walked around the statue. When we got to the back of the statue, 
there was a there was a plaque and on the plaque it said this is a very unusual buddha because it was constructed on the plans of artisans from greece artisans of alexander the great it's an ancient form of buddha and the greek origin then people started to open their eyes and saying oh wow greek goddess greek sculpture maybe pastor brian's right so behind the the, the statue there was a hole in the ground and uh, it, you couldn't see into it because it was like a, a black inky substance that was filled filled the 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 hole and uh, i said to some of our intercessors i need i need two of you to help me down into this hole because i'm going to go and pray against the base against the root of this statue and we're going to pray this uh demonic presence out of our city and uh we went down and my wife was was still standing on the side my wife margaret she was watching what happened and we descended into darkness and she said we actually disappeared we went out of out of sight because we went into what was what felt like liquid evil and until we reached the base of the statue and i felt the wall with my hand in front of me and all i could think of there this is it is crazy but all i could think of was john wayne and you everybody know john wayne you know the actor the cowboy and i i just said to them this town isn't big enough for the both of us one of us has got to get out of town and it ain't me so demon get out of town artemis get out of town and the blackness went out of the hole and all the pastors in the city saw it they saw this blackness just drift out of the hole and on the wall at the base of this statue there was another plaque and it was written in english which was unusual not in thai but it said on that plaque you have received your healing and from that moment i got better uh the doctors had actually given me two weeks to live and this was 15 years ago so i want to tell you the spiritual forces above your city are real but god has called you and god has equipped you to stand up and to declare this city belongs to jesus and to speak peace and to speak blessing over your city and see the darkness leave just like it did in our city we know we're living in an evil day there's been a global pandemic which is i mean i was supposed to come to this conference last year and, right <laughs> and and the the pandemic has taken over our lives just when we think things are getting better the war in ukraine is now affecting us and and on the bbc news today it said it's going to affect africa more than anywhere else because of the lack of grain being shipped from ukraine to africa the threat of fuel and food shortages are becoming real in every part of the world we we just uh, had a 30% increase in the cost of living here in phuket just in a in a matter of days the cost of living has gone up by 30% we have 90% unemployment on our island because we're a tourist island and we've been closed lots of hotels are empty corruption in government is being exposed even today on the news corruption in the united nations the world is being shaken and we know this is something that god is allowing because hebrews 12:20 says 27 says that he will shake the earth and the reason why god allows this shaking is so that that which cannot be shaken may remain now what is it that cannot be shaken dare i say that our faith our walk with jesus is the thing that cannot be shaken and the world will see when the when the day of evil passes a day of the lord begins 
And uh, so I'm looking forward to sharing a few things about my journey with you today. And we'll look a little bit more in scripture tomorrow and, and some powerful testimonies that we've seen uh, where we've seen God move uh, through extraordinary miracles. We'll share with you that tomorrow. But today, I just want to share a little bit of my story, where I've come from. Uh, I, I'm, I'm from a working class background. Uh, my father was a bricklayer. My mother was worked in a, a, a shoe factory. And uh, I, I, here I am today, having ministered to kings, to prime ministers, to presidents, to, to all over the world. And when you think, how on earth could God use a guy from uh, Wolverhampton in the UK, send him out with two suitcases, one for me, one for my wife, to Thailand 33 years ago, where we got sent to a demon-infested island, and yet God has raised me up to minister to nations. And my wife... Uh, Similar story, she was a missionary's daughter. She was conceived in Congo. She was born in um, Bujumbura in Burundi in hospital. She then moved to Nairobi and she grew up in Nairobi. Then she went to England and then she went on a missions trip to Austria where she met me and now she's ended up in Thailand. Uh, so... The poor girl has had nowhere to call home <laughs> until she finally realized this is home is wherever God wants you to be. And when you when you put the two of us together, there's nothing about us, but there's something special about Jesus. And Jesus, together with us, makes a potent combination. So I want to encourage you to believe that all things are possible. My the verse that is my favorite verse in the Bible, the verse that I live by is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Amen. So let the Lord speak to you today. You know, the nature of our walk with Jesus should be such that it is the one thing about me that cannot be shaken. No matter what is going on in the world. John 15 says this. Jesus said, abide in me and I in you. Whoever abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Wow, that's a promise. And that is the truth. And we need to take hold of the truth and stand upon the truth and declare the truth in the darkness. It doesn't matter what the world throws at me, what schemes the devil has to derail me or what temptations come my way that naturally speaking, I would succumb to, if I abide in Jesus and his word abides in me, all I have to do is ask and God will change that situation by faith. You know, um, we face opposition and the enemy will make sure that whatever we confess will get tested. A few weeks ago, I was told that a leader in our church had been rushed into hospital. If you've uh, read this book, Ecclesia, by Dr. Ed Silvoso, I'm part of his global leadership team. And uh, this is a really must read if you, if you want to see your nation change. If you've read that book, you'll have heard a story about uh, a member of our church called the ice cream lady. And uh, my wife and I had been meeting with someone, actually we'd been meeting with a Canadian ambassador. And we were then driving on to the hospital because we'd heard that the ice cream lady had become sick and she'd been taken, rushed into hospital. And on the way, we received a phone call to say that she died. Now, she just received a prophetic word from Dr. Ed Silvoso that she was going to be instrumental in leading government leaders to Jesus. And now she dies. And so I said, that can't be right. I mean, I trust 
the prophetic word above the fact that she's dead. Right? You got that? I trust in the word of God above the fact that this lady is dead and lying in a morgue. So we got to get, we, we called our assistant uh, pastor, who's a Thai lady, and uh, we got together with her on the phone and we prayed that the ice cream lady would come back to life. Just as we finished praying, I got a call from the ice cream lady's daughter. And she said, I'm stood next to my mum and she's in the morgue and she's just about to be injected with formaldehyde when she woke up. And she said to me, God sent me back. He told me my work isn't finished yet. Well, we were thrilled. Uh, the the um, folks working in the morgue uh, were in shock because they'd never seen a dead person come back to life before. A daughter was crying and just absolutely, totally changed by the power of God because she'd previously been an unbeliever. When I read my Bible, I read that the Apostle Paul found himself in a tight spot of a different kind. When he faced the greatest group of thinkers in the world at the time, and he knew that he had something profound to teach them. He was in Athens before the Areopagus and he addressed the crowd and said something that is the key to walking in the power and authority of God. He said to them from Acts 17, 28, in him we live, in him we move and in him we have our being. Now, my wife, Margaret and I were already together with Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. I called my assistant pastor and we prayed together on the phone. And because we live and move and have our being in Jesus. As we commanded the ice cream lady to wake up, who was in, not even with us, but in another location, God raised her from the dead. Now. That is just amazing. I, 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 I stand in awe nearly every day to the power of God and what he is capable of. But that just didn't just happen. A process had to start in me to take me to the point where extraordinary miracles become the norm, not the exception. Hallelujah. When I first became a Christian, I actually witnessed someone being raised from the dead. And it was a story I related to other people for years. I'd seen it. But I didn't do the praying. I didn't lay on the hands. I was just in the same room. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time to witness the miracle. I shared the story, but it wasn't actually my testimony. It was an eyewitness account. It's a bit like going to a football match. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a soccer fan. I know Richard's a rugby fan, but I'm talking about the real game soccer. Right? And um, <laughs> he's shaking his head there. Right. And it's just like going to a soccer match and seeing your, your team score the winning goal. Wow, that's a fantastic feeling. But it wasn't my foot that kicked the ball. It wasn't me that scored. It didn't. It wasn't my pass that made it happen. Only the people playing in the game on the pitch have that ultimate feeling of success. However happy I was, I was just a spectator. Yet, when I learned to hold hands with Jesus and walk with him all the time, so that in him I live and move and have my being, I started to understand what it was like to be a player, not a spectator. Because together with Jesus, all things are possible. And I saw miracles start to happen.
I wasn't the source of the power. I didn't have the authority. But God chose to use me to demonstrate his awesome power and wonder to the world. And I partnered with God to make it happen. Isn't that, a cra- isn't that incredible? Isn't that a wonderful privilege we have as sons of God to partner with Jesus? As a child, I often dreamt of scoring the winning goal for my team. But as a child of God, I became God's center forward. And it was the same what happened with Paul. In Acts 19, 11, we read this. And God was performing extraordinary miracles through the hands of Paul. God and Paul working together. God and me working together. God and you working together. This is what we were born again to do. God born. God wants a relationship with us, but he also has a purpose for us to continue the work of Jesus. And we know from 1 John 3, 8, it says, for this purpose, Christ was re- revealed to do what? In line with what Richard was telling us this morning, to destroy the works of the evil one. It can say amen to that. Anyone? Yeah, this is our job, to destroy the works of the evil one and to build the kingdom of God. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that worth being alive for? Even in these dark times, we are the answer. The church is the answer. Praise God. But how does that happen? You know, in our church in Thailand, we're not strangers to extraordinary miracles. We have children who pray for the sick. And if someone comes into our church with cancer, I'll say, oh, get this Sunday school to pray for them. Right? Fantastic. And the kids are there praying and seeing people healed. Um, one time we prayed for a lady who had cancer of the throat and it, she just spat it out and completely healed. Right? I, had, uh, I was lying uh, in a hospital bed at one point and I had a back spasm, you know, where the, where the vertebrae trap the nerve and I was, I was facing six months in traction and a, one of the six-year-olds from Sunday school came with his parents to pray for me and he came up and he just said, Father, God, this is my pastor. Can you heal him, please? And the pain went and I was healed. And not only did that cut down six months of traction, it also cut down six months of hospital bills. Thank you, Jesus. So, you know, if a six-year-old can do this, then why can't we? We have grandmas who pray for the dead and see them raised up. In fact, we have so many stories of resurrections I could fill the time today and tomorrow just with stories on resurrections. Something has happened, not just in me, but in the whole congregation, that they are empowered to believe that nothing is impossible. It wasn't always like that, of course. I can remember feeling very discouraged when I kept relating a healing miracle that happened in the early years of our church in Phuket. When I first gave the testimony, I said, yesterday, God healed a woman of cancer. And whoa, wow, isn't that fantastic? But it wasn't long before I was saying a few weeks ago, God healed a woman of cancer. And then it became a few months ago, God healed a woman of cancer. And it wasn't long before it was eight years ago, God healed a woman of cancer. He can do it again. And it seems to be the the norm in most churches where miracles are few and far between. But that isn't a true representation of my God. Because my God is able to do the miraculous at all times. Not just events that we relate to in testimonies of the past, but a living reality. God is real all the time. In him, I live. In him, I move. In him, I exist. And so his power, his authority, 
has been designated to me and to everyone who believes. Dr. Ed Silvoso teaches that prayer should be more about abiding in God and not just talking to him. This is why we need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, you know, your city can be baptized in the spirit. Your nation can be baptized in the spirit. And that is something amazing that is another story to go into. I won't bother with that. But hopefully Dr. Ed will come some point and talk to you about that. Jesus is able to abide in us at all times. You know, Jesus told his disciple that on several occasions that he would ask the father to send the comforter to them, someone who would guide them and facilitate his manifest presence within them. This is why I need to be filled with the spirit, why I need to have a life of seeking the presence of God daily so that he can dwell within me by his manifest presence. The Holy Spirit gives us constant access to Jesus, helps us to do the things that God wants us to do, to pray the right prayers, to go to the right places, to say the right things. You know, before I used to decide where I went to minister and I would say, God, can you bless what I'm doing? But, you know, if Jesus abides in me. And I'm listening to him. He will tell me the right place to go. And I will find myself praying the prayers that he wants me to pray. And, you know, when my prayers and God's prayers are the same, miracles happen. Yeah, that's the key. If you want to know how does a miracle happen when my prayer becomes Jesus's prayer. Rather than asking Jesus to bless what I want. I have to get into alignment with what he wants. So that what I say, what I do, where I go, how I minister is in accordance with his plan for me every day. In Acts 1, 4, Jesus told the disciples to wait for the promise of the father. And then in verse 8, he told them that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit had come upon them. And that they would be witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's a progression. You will be witnesses where you are. You will be witnesses to your city. You'll be witnesses to uh, your province. You will be witnesses to your nation and to other nations to the ends of the earth. It's a progression. It starts where I am. I can't expect to win a nation for Jesus if I can't win my family for Jesus. Amen. Right? And how do I win my family for Jesus? By listening to what God wants me to say to them, how he wants me to minister to them. Jesus made it clear what the disciples were to do. Three things. Wait upon the Lord. Then they would receive power through the Holy Spirit. And then they were to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. And these three things are very important for us to grasp. There's an order to things, the way God does things. We need to seek him. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what? All these other things, all the things you need, all the things you want will be added to you. But seek God first. Throughout my Christian experience, I've had glimpses of these things. I've engaged in lengthy times of prayer and fasting. I've had power encounters with the Holy Spirit. And, and, and I, even to the point where Margaret and I left the UK 33 years ago and came to live in Thailand, uh, where we had to learn a, a new language, a new culture, do everything in a different way. We've done all those things. But these things tended to focus around events, power times in the Holy Spirit. But not, God doesn't want us to live from event to event. He wants us to have a lifestyle of abiding in him all the time. 
so that I know his presence wherever I go, whatever I do. And I know what to do when I'm challenged by the enemy. So how did I change? Well, it, it took a world event to change me. Uh, it happened in 2004, and it was the Asian tsunami. Uh, it hit Phuket on the morning of 26th of December. My wife and I were woken up with a, by an earthquake. It was Sunday morning. We were, we were planning church. Well, we, we felt the quake, and then it stopped, and we thought, oh, well, no damage. We actually lost a bauble on the Christmas tree. It fell and smashed on the floor. We thought, well, that's not too bad. Earthquakes are normally worse than that. We've lost one bauble on the tree. So we didn't think anything of it. And we went to church. And for the first time in the history of our church, this is God's plan and purpose. We had 100% attendance. Absolutely everybody was in church, including people we didn't know. People had come to church for the first time, unprecedented. We were absolutely packed out. And we couldn't understand. We thought, wow, this is fantastic. What is God doing? How on earth have we got this many people in church? We're, our church seated about 150, and we surely had 250 crammed in to the church. There were kids were sat all over the floor. It was you, you couldn't move. And then the news reached us of a tsunami. So the first thing everyone asked me was, what's a tsunami? We'd never heard the word before. What is it? And we had to look it up. And we, reports started to come of this big wave. People left church and went home to find that there was, there was no home to go to. Their homes had been destroyed. But the church was on a hill. Praise God. And everyone that came to church on Sunday was saved. They didn't die. Now, there's something to preach to the congregation. <laughs> Get everybody in church, right? Come to church and you will live. <laughs> well, it was true that Sunday. But by Sunday evening, our church had completely changed. It had become a hospital. Thousands of people were injured. There were the, the hospitals were overflowed, and I got a call from the local hospital near to the church and said, can we use the church? So I said, yeah, sure, bring people in. And on that first night, the church floor was full of people. And uh, one person looked up at me and she said, this is a church, right? I said, yeah. So you're the pastor? I said, yes. She said, well, can you tell me this? And she was really annoyed because she was the only one, a family of six, she was the only one that had survived and she looked at me with tears in her eyes she said why did God allow this to happen and I, I, I just didn't know what to say I was completely broken I didn't know what to tell this woman I was so disturbed that I had to leave the room I went upstairs and I went into my office and I just wept and I cried out to God. I said, God, what do I say? How do I help them? God, help me to help them. And uh, something happened that took me by surprise because God spoke to me. And to be honest, I didn't like what he said. Has that, have you ever had that experience? Well, you've asked God to speak to you and you don't like what he tells you. He said to me, Go and tell them that within 24 hours, every single member of their families that they have lost will be restored to them unharmed. And I, what? I, I, there were 27 people who were on the church floor and they'd all lost members of their family because the wave just smashed everything up and separated people and... Uh, there were dead bodies lining the beaches and uh, it was it was just chaos. It was just awful. And um, God gave me this word. So I went, I said, I called the church elders together and my wife. And I said, uh, guys, God's just told me to tell them this. And they looked at me in horror. They said, you can't tell them that. There'll be a riot. I said, what, what if you're not, what, what if it doesn't happen? But, you know, 
the conviction of the Holy Spirit within me was so strong that I had to overcome my fear of what might not happen. So I stood up in the, in the, in, in the sanctuary. They were all over the floor of the church. And I said to them, could I just speak to you for a second? I said, you are in the place of miracles. And God has told me to tell you that within 24 hours, all your lost relatives will be restored to you, complete and whole. And the place was silent. My wife had her head in her hands. She couldn't believe I'd said it. The church elders were looking around thinking, I don't know whether we're going to come back to church tomorrow. <laughs> the people on the floor were looking at me like I was crazy. And sometimes, you know, following God means that you're out on your own and you're standing on land where people fear to tread. But you have to be bold in the Lord and you have to know that he is with you. And you know, one thing that I said, even though no one believed what I said, yet I knew that the conviction of the Holy Spirit was true within me. Well, to cut a very long story short, uh, there were amazing miracles. Miracles just started to happen. Each family experienced the impossible. 27 people, 27 families. And over 50 people presume lost and presume dead. But literally, with just a few seconds left of the 24 hours, the last relative walked into church. And everyone, every family was restored. And people looked at me and said, what on earth has just happened? The story of that last person walking into church was the most amazing one. She was uh, the lady who asked me the question. She was one of six. The first person we found was her husband. They were from Sweden. And uh, we found her husband, Bjorn, somewhere about 10 miles away in, a, in another, uh, in a hotel. And I walked in to a hotel room. And there were a thousand men from Sweden in that hotel that had been rescued. And the guy's name that we were looking for was Bjorn. That's like John in English, right? So there's a thousand guys, probably 90% of them are called Bjorn. So I just shouted out, Bjorn, are you here? And one guy walked in the, from the middle of the crowd and walked up to me. And I said, I'm Bjorn. I said, are you Bjorn Val? He said, yes, I am. I said, I've got your wife at church. Come with me. And I just thought, how on earth did I find him? It was like a needle in a haystack. But there he was. And we kept, we went through the family. There was a young boy. He was found in one of the hospitals and we brought him back. His name was Johannes Val. And, to, and today, Johannes Val plays in the Premier League in Sweden for one of the football teams. But he was, he was in hospital and was supposed to die because he'd ingested sand and salt water into his lungs. And we prayed for him and the sand went. And I, I was too amazed to think God's just done a miracle. I was just living in amazement during that time because God was doing miracles all around me. And I thought I was dreaming. But when it came to the last person, their eldest daughter was named Linnea and we couldn't find her anywhere. And time was running out. We heard a rumor that there was a blonde haired Swedish girl had been rescued by a helicopter at sea and taken to uh, another town, which was 200 miles away. This is, this is the scope of the tsunami. And uh, I, sat, I said to my secretary, can you take Bjorn to this, this other town and go and check the hotels there? We didn't know which hotel. There were 50 hotels in the town. They called me after a couple of hours and said, 
we've uh, after they got there and uh, so we've searched through 15 hotels we can't find her I says keep going they literally got to the last room in the last hotel and there she was and they walked they drove back and they walked through the door with seconds to spare and I want to tell you that church was not a hospital anymore it was the throne room of heaven people who had no interest in God we had a mafia boss from the Ukraine with two of his prostitutes who were on our floor they gave their lives to Jesus and th this was just incredible how do you reach a, a, a Ukraine mafia boss? Well, you send him on holiday to Thailand. He gets swept out to sea in a tsunami. And then he comes to the church of where miracles happen. That's how. God has a plan for everybody. We just have to get in tune with God's plan to make it happen. And uh, the next day, we took the Val family into hospital because the mother needed an operation on her ankle. And... Linnea, the, the girl, went to have a checkup as well. She had a laceration from her elbow to her shoulder that had been bandaged up. And the doctor came to me and said, I need you to talk to the family and tell them that we've got to amputate this girl's arm because she'd been, with this laceration, she'd been in the sea for 20 hours. And it's got, it's, she's got gangrene. We need to amputate her, heart, her arm now. So I just said, what? And I didn't say it to the doctor. I said it to God. I said, what? You told me to tell them that they'll all be come back and there would be no harm done. They would all be restored and there would be no harm. And now I've got to tell the family that this girl has got to have her arm amputated. And it was almost though, as God said, God said to me, hang on a minute, you've been seeing all these miracles and you're worried about a laceration on the arm. He said, tell the doctor you want a second opinion. So I did. I said, doctor, I want a second opinion. And he says, what, what kind of second opinion is there with gangrene? I said, I don't, I don't care. I said, bandage the arm up and we'll... I said to my secretary again, it's great to have a secretary, uh, drive her down to, the other to another hospital and get her checked out there. So 20 minutes later, I got a phone call from a secretary and she said, Pastor, I'm going to pass out. And, she, and I heard a bump on the floor. And she, bless her, she hadn't slept for five days. So I rushed down to the other hospital and I found Linnea and my secretary next to each other in two, two beds in the hospital. And the doctor came to me and she said, are, are you responsible for these girls? I said, yes, yeah. He says, well, who's put this bandage on this Swedish girl's arm? I said, oh, they did it at the other hospital. I said, well, what are they wasting bandages for? We need bandages. And I said, what, what do you mean? So he came to me and he says, well, look at her arm. There's nothing wrong with it. And the laceration that I'd seen had gone, completely gone, completely disappeared. I'm trying to think, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wake up soon. <laughs> this is crazy. I would have thought, no, but no, I can't have been asleep for five days. This is unbelievable. What is God doing? Well, a few days after, Linnea and her family were being shipped back to Sweden. And she came to me with tears in her eyes. And she said, thank you so much. And I just said to her, don't thank me, thank my boss, meaning God. How do you, you know, new Christians, so I just wanted to do it in simple terms. But a few months later, a newspaper article appeared in the national press in Sweden. Every newspaper had this on the front page. And it was headlined, don't thank me, thank my boss. Linnea had told the story of the miracles to the press in Sweden and it went viral on the TV, everywhere. 
a year later, Margaret and I were asked to go to Sweden by the king and queen of Sweden. And so we think, well, you can't turn that down, can you? Um, so it wasn't in our plans, but we thought, OK, when the king and queen invite you, you better go. So we arrived in Sweden and going to see the families. There were two or three Swedish families that had been on the floor of that church. So we were going to visit them. We arrived in Sweden and we landed in the plane and they announced on the uh on the intercom and the, the plane, uh, please, everyone stay seated. We have some VIPs on the plane and they need to get off first. So we sat down and thought, we'll just wait. And uh, no one seemed to be getting off. Uh, and then one of the air stewardesses came to me and said, we mean you. You you are the VIPs. You need to get off. And we were looking at Margaret. I mean, no one's ever called me VIP. It's all ever, right? What are you doing? I mean, don't you know my dad was a bricklayer? Don't you know my mum worked in a factory? Right? I mean, how am I a VIP? I'm just nobody. No, you're not, said God. You're my child. You're my ambassador. And now, today, you are my ambassador to Sweden. Wow. So we got off the plane. We opened the door of the plane. And there was a band playing. And we went down the steps. And there was a red carpet. <laughs> and I'm looking at Margaret and thinking, what on earth are we, getting? what's happening here? Right? I, don't get, I don't get it. And there was a reception committee and there was the mayor of the city. And, and we could see the families we'd helped. There was Linear and, and, and Bjorn and everyone, all the families that stood there and all the civic dignitaries, cameras uh, from newspapers, from TV. Everyone was there and we walked down. And everyone started applauding. And I looked behind to see who else had come up. And it was to us. And I'm thinking, what's going on? And in my heart, I could, all I could say was, this is for you, Jesus. This is for you. It's not for us. This is for you. And, you know, one of the things in Transform Our World that we believe is that God has called us. To see not just individuals transformed, but nations transformed. One act of faith, of believing God in an impossible situation. When I said to the people in that church, this is the place of miracles. And within 24 hours, God will restore all your relatives. When I said that, God opened the door and opened a bigger door and a bigger door and a bigger door to the now I'm addressing a nation on live television, every channel. And I'm saying glory to God who brought salvation to these families. And they give me some award. I don't know what it is because I don't read Swedish. And they take me around the city that I've got functions to go to and and I'm just sitting there and there's, uh, if it's Swedish, I haven't got a clue what's going on. People are just speaking Swedish. And I'm just sitting there next to my wife thinking, I don't know, it sounds, it feels like we're, do you remember the Muppet show? And they had the Swedish chef. It's, it's like that. I haven't got a clue what's being said. But people are giving glory to God because at the end of every speech, some pastor in the town gets up and prays. A blessing over the people and I'm thinking this is incredible we walk in the streets people are coming up asking for autographs taking photographs of us and I'm thinking what is going on what is going on is that God is giving me the faith to believe that insignificant person that I am working class guy from what he's thought of in the UK as, as the worst accent. I hope you're coping with my accent, by the way, as people who think mine is the worst English accent ever, right? And yet God has put me in a position to speak to a nation, to tell them that there is a God and he loves you and he cares for you. Put your faith in him. This is what God wants to do with you. 
You are a child of God and God has given you this promise in Psalm 2, 8, which is totally in line with what Pastor Richard started off with this morning. God says, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Do you believe that for South Africa? Do you believe that for Kenya? Do you believe that for your nation? In the name of Jesus, I speak that which God has ministered to me. I speak to you right now in the name of Jesus. Receive that faith. Receive that belief that this same Jesus lives in you. This same Jesus abides in you and you abide in him. And you li- And from now on, your desire is to live in him, to walk in him, to move in him, to have your being in him. And by his guidance, by his power, he will show you the keys to break the darkness, the hold of darkness over your city and to bring the light. You know, when Jesus came to this earth, he said, I am the light of the world. But before he left it, he turned to his disciples and he said, you are the light of the world. So I leave that with you today. You are the light of the world. Bring the light and break the darkness in Jesus' name. Amen.